we give him praise. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Very fitting song. I told Brother Cecil she had no idea what I was planning on talking about. It fits right in with what I plan to talk about in this first service. And we would turn to Psalms 20, chapter 23. David said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thine are with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to talk from this subject. Is the Lord your shepherd? Is the Lord. David said the Lord is my shepherd. But the question that I'm asking each and every person in here today. Is the Lord your shepherd? Lay your Bibles down and let's go to the Lord. Brother Sage, why don't you bless the word of the Lord? Hallelujah. You can be seated. I don't know if this would be considered teaching or preaching. I consider it probably going to be more teaching. Uh, but I felt it for this service today. Life is not an easy journey. The road is not always smooth. The conditions are not always favorable. Many hazards lie along the way. And while life contains many joys, and it can also be plagued by many sorrows. It can be confusing. At even times, it can be terrifying. Furthermore, our needs for the journey are never-ending. We often feel helpless. We often feel overwhelmed. It seems like no matter how many battles that we win, we continue to face new battles that we get overwhelmed by. Clearly, we were not created to navigate this life alone. Next to John 3.16, Psalm 23 is probably the most beloved passage in all of the Word of God. Great 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon entitled it the peril of the Psalms. It is the Psalms that people turn to in life's most difficult times. For centuries, it has given comfort, it's given peace, it's given hope to those who read it. Many of I preach more than my share, more than I want to. Funerals in my lifetime. And I always, a lot of times, it can be, I hate to put it this way, I'm not their judge, but there's a different feeling that happens when you know the life of the individual that's laying in the coffin, especially when you pastor them. I, I mean, I preach people funerals, I didn't even know them from Adam. I was just trying to help out, you know, and everything. Elder Mills has, I'm sure, done the same thing many a time. And so there's times that understand I've, I'm not one of the preachers that you probably want if you just want me to make up a bunch of lies about you. Because it ain't going to happen. At the same time, I'm not here to talk about how much sin this person in the coffin's done because I can't do nothing to help them anyway. I've seen people before that says, I don't want you preaching to me, preacher, where you hear this about them. I can't do nothing for them. 
I'm trying to keep you from going to where maybe they went or trying to get you to go where they went, one way or the other. But many a times, regardless of what I preach at the funeral, it's usually the same message regardless of how I feel about maybe their soul when I get out to the graveside. And I'll, I don't make a graveside a very elaborate thing. It's, I, I mean, what's been said is probably pretty much been said at that church. And maybe sometimes they're sitting out in the heat and maybe the bad weather or whatever. But I, I always like to leave with some words of comfort. Because regardless, this person could have been the biggest sinner in the world. That's still their family. They could have been the biggest saint in the world. That's still their family. And so I often, I don't know if there's been a funeral that I haven't uh, preached when I got to that graveside that I didn't take that Bible and I didn't open it up and uh, for uh, just a last reading of Scripture. And I'll turn to Psalm 23. And I'll begin to read these scriptures, and then I'll simply usually say, um, if you would, you know, let, let's just bow our head and have a closing word of prayer. Now, if you prefer I not do that at your funeral, it'd be best you tell me now, and I'd rather you tell me now than you tell me after you die. <laughs> Most commentators believe that David wrote Psalms 23. Late in his life. If that is the case, we find David that he is a very mature individual. Filled with his share of the conflict and passion and the, the confusion problems that confront any human being. But not only was David the heroic slayer of Goliath. The devoted friend of Jonathan. The lover of music, an able king, but he was also a fugitive. He was also an adulterer. He was also a murderer. As a father, David had watched his baby die, and he had wept when his ungrateful son Absalom was slain as he led an armed rebellion against his father. David has not left us with only beautiful thoughts. Let me keep you in mind, this is just the everyday rain that we have for the last six months. <laughs> David has not left us with only beautiful thoughts, but it is with a honest testimony about God that David learned while living his life to the hilt. If written in his latter years, David's mind truly traveled back for the Hoyt to his younger days when he tended to his father's sheep. There before David was ever known in Jerusalem, the Lord had given him a living illustration of his abundant care for his people. Now in old age here, David, after Goliath is over with, after Saul is over with, after Bathsheba is over with, Uriah, Amnon, Absalom, David is reflecting back on his life and more fully understood something of the depths of the Lord's care. He had walked many times through the valley of the shadow of death, but now it appears to be close at hand. He knew he could not escape it as he had before. I was telling somebody just the other day, I said, I'm praying for a miracle. I, it was my nanny. I'm praying for a miracle. But I hate to tell you this or put it to you like this. We got to also pray for God's will. You say, but it's God. It ain't always God's will to heal. I know he raised Lazarus from the dead, but guess what? Lazarus died again. And God didn't raise him from the dead. We all don't die one time. So here it is that David is facing this time. He faced his approaching death with courage. He faced it knowing that he would dwell in God's house forever. Jehovah, who had shepherded him through all the storms that David had in his life, would guide him safely through death's valley and into his own glorious presence. 
Jacob was the first one that we find in the Bible that described the Lord as a shepherd of his people. This image is developed progressively uh, throughout Scripture until it finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Most scholars view Psalms 23, 2, Psalms 23, and Psalms 24 as a eunuch that prophetically depicts the ministry of Jesus Christ as a shepherd. The New Testament identifies Jesus as the good shepherd. And John 10 and 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Then it depicts him as the great shepherd. He says in Hebrews 13 and 20 through 21, Now the God of peace... That brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. That great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you. In you that which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then the Bible tells us, last but not least, that he is the chief shepherd. In 1 Peter 5 and 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So the image of the shepherd was very familiar to the people of Israel. As many of the nation's patriarchs had tended and taken care of sheep. So it is critical, important for the readers to understand when we read this, to understand the ancient role of the shepherd in order to fully grasp the profound truths of Psalm chapter 23. Shepherds cared for their sheep. They cared for their every need. They helped them give birth. They fed them. They protected them. They guided them. They rescued them. And they disciplined them. For all practical purposes, the shepherds lived with their sheep. In contrast, the extremely wealthy of that society, often hired employees, referred to as hirelings to take care of their flocks for them. Jewish society sharply distinguishes between the shepherds and the hirelings. Shepherds owed their sheep excuse me, owned their sheep and cared deeply for them. Their sheep was more, though, than a mere commodity to them. Shepherds risked their lives to defend or to rescue one of their sheep. In fact, Scripture records that David fought a lion and that he fought a bear to protect his father and therefore his flock. Simply stated, Shepherds loved their sheep. Hirelings were characterized completely differently. They could be impatient. They could be very cruel to the sheep that they tended and taken care of. Often beating them and mercifully driving them. Jesus, too, made a distinction between shepherds and hirelings. He said that hirelings flee when the wild animals or other dangers threaten the sheep. They flee because they don't care for the sheep. They're not concerned for the sheep. This lesson is very striking. The difference between shepherds and hirelings is not in their job description, but rather in their hearts. It is equally important. To understand the nature of sheep in order to fully appreciate this psalms. Now when I say this, some of you are able to get offended because you're considered a sheep. But I'm also considered a sheep. I'm an under-shepherd, but I'm a sheep before I'm a shepherd. So this is just the characteristics. Take it up with the Lord. He called us sheep. And he's a great shepherd. But sheep are known... A sheep is all the things that we do not want to be. A sheep is known to be dumb, stubborn, defenseless, without a sense of direction, prone, prone excuse me, to wonder, 
slow to recognize danger, nervous and uneasy, easy, excitable, and frightened. One thing is certain about sheep. They will perish if left to themselves. When Jesus saw the multitude, he had deep compassion upon them. They were like sheep, the Bible said, Brother Smith, that were without a shepherd, wandering helplessly, without protection, and without care. So we go now to our scripture here. Hallelujah. Hold on just a second. Our special speaker for the second service was texting me, so I was texting him back. He don't realize I'm in church. Hallelujah. So we go here to our first scripture. I'm sorry. The Lord is my shepherd. When David said that the Lord was his shepherd, he was acknowledging that he was like a shepherd. He was certainly not, excuse me, let me back up here. He was acknowledging, David was, that he was like sheep. David said, he's, the Lord is my shepherd, so the Lord, if he's a shepherd, he's taking care of sheep. So what David is admitting is, I'm part of the sheep folk. That is not something that's very flattering to acknowledge. Before we can ever enjoy the marvelous blessings of Psalm chapter 23, we too should accept and admit that we are all like sheep. It is only when we recognize how helpless that we are, our desperate need for a shepherd, that we can enter through the gate or through the door with Jesus Christ himself and become one of the great shepherd's flock. Notice this. David did not say that the Lord is a shepherd. He did not say that the Lord is the shepherd. He did not say that the Lord is our shepherd. But David said that the Lord is my shepherd. And he continues on and he says, I shall not want. David's shepherd was the Lord himself. Therefore, he could declare with absolute confidence, I shall not want. He could journey through life absolutely sure that the shepherd would take care of him. He rested in the knowledge that he would never lack the necessities of life because the Lord would enable him to thrive. Now, very easy. I'm going to blow a message right quick. But y'all, hallelujah, so I'll talk about it down the road. If I heard this story it was told the other day, and he, he told the story about this young uh, of his son, and he said his son's just the type, maybe he's like Easton. Right now with Easton, everything is why, 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 why. You could say we're gonna get on the roof right now, and Easton would say why, you know, everything's why. And Chase, if you ever get tired of it, blame it on his mama because she does the exact same thing. All right, and uh, it, it, why, and so. But think about it in this context. Brother Jerry, when your children was getting, uh, was growing up, and if one of them come to you, and Wyatt, and he'd say, Wyatt, come to you, and he said, Daddy, are we don't eat breakfast in the morning? I meant, you eat breakfast every morning. But the kid is going to bed feeling like, there's an uncertainty there. Or we don't eat breakfast in the morning. Yes. Haven't you always ate breakfast? Hadn't I've always provided? Hadn't I've always? Now, we go through life asking God those kind of questions all the time. What would happen? Because the Bible talks about those that don't believe will not receive. What would happen to what if he was little and you told him, son, the next time you ask that, you're not getting breakfast. Or instead of telling him that, the next morning, you don't give him breakfast. 
and you tell him the reason you're not getting breakfast is I have always provided for you. I always told you I would take care of you. And because you did not believe me, you will not receive. I promise you, he'll never ask you again. He's going to get up that day and say, my goodness, this is a great day. I'm looking to see what daddy has prepared for me or mama's prepared for me. Hallelujah. You see what I'm talking about? What if God, after he has promised us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and we continue to ask God, or you really don't move before my behalf? Or... If we say, God, I know you're going to move in this situation because you said in your word, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Think about it. He moves on and he says in the second verse, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. The shepherd's unselfish love for his sheep is seen not only in the fact that the shepherd provides for us. But also in the fact that he provides for us the things that we need. Green pastures, meadows with newly sprouted grass, were not abundant in the land of Palestine. A shepherd had to go, had to work tirelessly to find a place where the grasses were lush. Steel waters are literally waters that have been steeled. Sheep, if you study it out, are very jittery. They're very fearful. And they refuse to drink from running waters. So caring shepherds, would many times they would gather the rocks and they would dam up a stream and, and, and so that their sheep could be able to drink without fear. Rarely would the hirelings, rarely would the uncaring shepherds go to the efforts to find green pastures. They would heartlessly force their sheep to feed on dry desert weeds. They seldom tried hard to find a place where the sheep could drink freely. Instead, they callously allowed the sheep to suffer thirst until they happened upon still drinking water. One of the things I noticed with studying this is that sheep will not lie down when they're hungry. A resting sheep is a contented sheep, a satisfied sheep. David's picture is one of a flock of sheep that is quietly grazing in the pasture and then after feeding, lying down in the green pasture to chew the cud. The sheep could rest. Because their need for food, their need for water have been supplied. Likewise, the Lord's sheep will have their provisions met and will not lack for food nor water. Because of the nervous nature and often sure uh, stupidity of the sheep, they will not always lie down and rest when sheep and, excuse me, when sleeping sheep hear a noise they sprang to their feet and they refused to lie down again at these times a caring shepherd would sit down in the midst of the sheep and he'll take that restless sheep in his arms and he'll gently make it lie down I, I, we were just talking just last night brother Julian. I don't know if your two dogs have different personalities but mine do and um, I was sitting right there, and you could just barely, you know, the, both of them dogs are sound asleep on the couch last night. And I barely even made a, I'm talking about barely even kind of sound at all. And Mia, he is straight up looking around. And Leno, he's out like a light. You could have let the cannon go off. But Mia is a very, can be kind of a, a little skittish in, in that area right there. And I begin to think about how the Lord sometimes will take us up in his arms, wrap his arms around us, cause us sometimes 
to lie down when we don't want to lie down. Cause us sometimes to rest when we don't want to rest. Cause us sometimes to take a break when we don't want to take a break. And he'll cause us and get us to lie down in a place that he can communicate with us and talk to us. The Bible writer goes on and said, He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Restore is one of the most frequently used words in the Old Testament. It means to return or to turn back. In a number of instances, it conveys the ideal of, of it bringing back or carrying back. Many times it refers to repenting uh, and returning to the Lord. People frequently interpret it that he restores my soul as to mean spiritual or emotional refreshment or renewal. While the Lord certainly refreshes his people and strengthens their spirit, this is not the typical meaning of this Hebrew word in Psalms 23. See, sheep are notorious for wandering away from the foe, from the flock. For this reason, shepherds lead rather than drive their flocks, meaning they walk ahead of the sheep rather than behind them. This also means that when the shepherd does it, the sheep cannot see every move. So the sheep are easily distracted and they will roam and and. and, and Towards things that draw their attention off on the sidelines. They'll stop and they'll graze at a clump of grass while the rest of the flock is advancing. At other times they'll get startled and they'll run from the flock. And sometimes they'll aimlessly stray away for no reason at all. And when the sheep begin to drift from the fold, they place themselves in very grave danger. The Lord always seeks us, his sheep, when we stray. He loves us too much to leave us to perish in the wilderness of this sinful world. He personally seeks our rescue and our safety, leading us back to the path of righteousness, which literally means the right path. The right path. We're not always the easiest path for the sheep, but they were the safest for them. This is the way God leads us along the path that he has chosen according to his holy and his perfect will. Paths are trails that have been flattened, have been smoothed. They are the paths that God has laid by the commands of his word. He directs us along these paths for our safety, for our well-being, for our happiness. And as the Lord's sheep, we will not lack for guidance if we'll trust in him. Some sheep are especially willful and stubborn, leading to habitually for them to stray from the flock and turn their own way. Tradition says that in order to teach a rebellious sheep to stay close to the side, a shepherd of old might strike one of the sheep's legs with his staff and break the leg. Elder Uzzle, when one time on his trip to Israel when he was alive, actually seen a shepherd in the field. And the sheep had a little cash on the leg. And he said, what happened to the lamb? He said, it kept straying. So I had to break its leg. Brother Mills, that's, that's cruel. Would it be more cruel to have the leg broken and now the shepherd holding the lamb? Or for the lamb to be in the mouth of the lion or the wolf? Sometimes a man of God has to say things that he don't want to say. Do things that he don't want to do. He didn't call me to be a politician, or if he did, I would just tell you what you want to hear. I'd be the next Bill Clinton. I could just, whatever your float is, I, I, could, I could tell it. All right? I could just, you know, tell you exactly what you want to hear. I always said Bill Clinton was one of the best politicians there ever was. They didn't say he was good politics. It's just he knew how to move it over with people. But as a man of God, I can't do that. As a man of God, the watchman is responsible for what he sees when he stands on the wall. And the Bible said, cry loud and spare not. So if I don't cry, if I only tell you the good things, the blood is going to be on my hands and upon my head. Others 
shepherds would attach a weight to one of the sheep's legs to keep the sheep from wandering too far from the fold. The hindered sheep could not walk through rough spots or up hills, and it would quickly learn to stay close to the shepherd who would carry it through the difficult places. The lesson is clear. The Lord will correct us. His sheep, in order to keep us from straying too far away. He said, Brother Mills, I don't understand why all the junk is going on in my life, in my family, in my home and all that. Have you been straying? Because some of the stuff that you're blaming on the devil may be God correcting you and trying to bring you back to the fold. The little shepherd also restores cast sheep. Those cast away. These are sheep that have fallen or have rolled over onto their backs. Cast sheep are in grave danger, brother Manchester. Some of these sheep that are like it, they're, they're up on their back because they are unable to get up on their own. They can die and they will die within a short period of time if they are not rescued. Shepherds are constantly watching for cast sheep and they rush to restore them to their feet. Once riding, a cast sheep is usually disoriented and unsteady. And the shepherd would then gently caress them. They would gently support them and to their senses return. The Lord deeply loves and cares for us when we fall away and is always there to help us return to the fold. Can't tell how many times that I find people on their back, spiritually speaking. And I get them back where they need to be. I don't expect them to go from zero to 100 overnight. They're trying to get their bearings back. They're trying to get their senses back. But there comes a time that the only way the shepherd can help the sheep is that the sheep is willing to respond to the care that's being given. I cannot count how many times. I know, I, I know, and I wish everybody in here that could hear this. You may have never had a pastor before that's going to pick up the phone and send you a text message or call you to say, I missed you at church. Why do I do that? I do not do that because I don't have nothing else to do. I will get out of this suit around 10 to 11 o'clock tonight. I could get out way quicker. It's just I'll walk in and literally sit down at the table and start reaching out to people. Why do I do that for? I don't do that because I want to be the dictator in your life. I do it because I got a love and I got a concern for people. I do it also because that's the way I was taught to be a shepherd by somebody else that done the exact same thing. My father. I remember one time of asking my pastor, current pastor now, Brother Ozzel, how many times do I continue to text people over and over and over again? I was just venting, feeling sorry for myself. But I, to a point I had a reason to. <laughs> And they don't even reply. Now, let me just tell you. You say, well, Brother Mills, you can just get blunt with me. Well, let me just tell you what his response was to me. Quit whining. Quit belly aching. Shut up and have revival. That was his response, and that was all it was. And my response was, yes, sir. That, that was my response. Yes, sir. Because as long as there's breath, <laughs> as long as I can maybe get them back on their feet. But as much as I want to do it, there's part of it that is a sheep going to respond to the shepherd. Is a sheep going to respond? I've told individuals before, I said, I would rather you have them text me and said, I had a hard day at work and worked so hard, I'm just flat out wore out, I can't be there tonight, than to not even text me at all. Because when you don't text me at all and then I text and you ain't replying, I'm walking the floors at night. Now, you may not care for your soul, but I care for your soul because I've got a command from God that I've got to care for your soul. And so that's why at least I know where they're tired. 
At least I know they're, they're not discouraged. At least I know they're not sick in the hospital and then they'll get mad when I don't come pray for them and I didn't have no idea. Because usually the pastor is the last one to know anything. We just, you got a good message. The one we, I told, told you it's going to turn into a message for you. Hallelujah, that was good, but I'm not, I'm not going to blow it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so why does the Lord so carefully watch over his sheep? Why does he go to such great lengths to keep us on the right path? For his namesake, because of his character, his supreme love for us, he is faithful to all of us and will not lose a single one of his sheep. You say, the Lord will come. He's going to lead the 99. But before he leads them 99, he puts them in a secure place. Because we don't want to lose the 99 trying to reach the one. He will not allow us to depart completely from the path of righteousness, not if we are truly one of his sheep. He will do whatever is necessary to return any of us to his foe. Why? Because his name is... His reputation as a shepherd depends upon it. David observed that God always provides for his people throughout his long life. The psalmist had never seen one of the Lord's children begging for bread. Jesus taught us that our Heavenly Father knows our need even before we ask. Many people are plagued by doubt and they're plagued by worry. But when we trust our great shepherd, we do not have to worry about what we will eat, what we will drink, what tomorrow may hold. Trust and worry are contradictory. They work against each other. If we worry, we do not trust. Sheep simply follow their shepherd with the expectation that he will see to it that they receive the grass and the water that they need. And as sheep are prone to wander away from our shepherd, sometimes we stray deliberately. We choose to roam from the path of righteousness to, in order to follow the temptation and sins that is before us. Sometimes we stray aimlessly. It is possible, even while serving the Lord, to move far from his side and not even realize it. The writer says, in the fourth verse, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thine are with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The life of a sheep in Palestine was filled with threats, danger. It was nervous, uh, easily frightened nature of the sheep was justly aroused. And many people who live in this cold cruel grip of fear as one of God's dear followers David faced some of the same things that we face he faced many threatening circumstances yet in the midst of all his perils David found one thing to be unfailingly true his shepherd had been by his side through every hazard notice a change in the pronoun in verses 2 and 3, David was talking about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then, but he goes into verse 2 and he begins to talk about, in, in verse 2, he, he basically said, He maketh me to lie down. He leadeth me beside the still water. In the, verse 3, He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the pathways of righteousness for His name's sake. Uh, but, but when we begin to look here in verse 4, uh, and five, it begins to change. David is no longer speaking about his shepherd, but David is now speaking to his shepherd. He's no longer speaking about the shepherd. He's speaking to the shepherd. This suggests that the Lord is no longer out in front of David leading him, but rather he's beside him. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, for many people, the word valley calls forth the image of a flat, grassy expanse living peacefully between the mountains like a meadow. 
However, this is not what the word means or what Old Testament valleys were like. A valley was a deep ravine or a gorge. It was a narrow, dark, damp, and usually encased by steep stones all the way around walls, making it virtually inescapable. Valleys were frequently located at the foot of towering cliffs, and they were extremely dangerous snakes there, and wild beasts and criminals that would lurk in the darkness. Since grass grows in Palestine during a very short season, you wouldn't make much money there, Brother Hoyt. Shepherds struggle to feed their flocks the rest of the year. Often it become necessary to lead their sheep down into the valleys where the green plants grew in the cool, damp soil at the bottom. Passing through these valleys was absolutely necessary at times in order to reach pasture on the other side. Some scholars think that the valley of the shadow of death was the name of an actual valley, an extremely dangerous one, through which the shepherds and the flocks were forced to cross. Valleys are symbols of some of the darkest times of our lives. The valley of the shadow of death speaks of life's gravest circumstances, fearful occasions when death is a real possibility, such as maybe a severe illness, disease, attack on your health, on your family, serious accident. Deadly weather conditions, losing loved ones, whatever it may be, on and on and on. But David testified that he was not afraid to walk through life's darkest valleys. Although he was defenseless in himself, he was not alone in his peril. The shepherd, David's shepherd, his shepherd was with him. And the Lord would protect him and keep him close to his side. He said, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David was comforted. He turned from fear and terror because his shepherd was skillfully armed with his rod and with his staff. Now, I want you to understand something. I don't have a rod, uh, but I do have a staff in my office. I meant to bring it over here that Sister is a very prized thing that I have that Sister uh, Sally bought for me. And uh, as a gift, and but the rod was a club that the shepherds fashioned, and they would carry it with them to fight off the wild animals and the thieves. It was a deadly weapon. The staff was the instrument that the shepherds would use to deal with his sheep. It was not a weapon, but it was a tool. The shepherd leaned on it for support as he journeyed across. The rough grounds and across the rocky mountains areas. Most staffs had a hooked end, just like the one that I got, that the shepherd would use to catch the sheep's leg or around the neck to pull it out of a hole or back into the fold. The shepherd would nudge a sheep with his staff when it began to stray or when it become hesitant to move along with the flock. David was fearless in the valley because he knew that the shepherd would protect him from deadly threats. See, a hireling, somebody that don't have the heart of a shepherd, don't know when to use the right tool. and He'll use the rod when he should be using the staff. He'll use the rod on God's sheep. Brother Mills, I've never seen that happen. Well, you ain't traveled across the country like I have either. I've never had that happen to me either. But I've seen some people that I've walked into pulpits and preached behind some at some churches before where I felt like I got a whooping before after he got done whooping them. But that rod is to take care of the enemy. But at the same time, that staff, that staff. It's going to pull them out of some situations. It's going to bring them to a place. It's going to nudge them back into the fold. It's there to help them. It's there to, it's there to get them back to where they need to be. 
David was fearless in the valley because he knew that his shepherd would protect him from all of the deadly threats, including his waywardness. His shepherd would keep him close to his side in the darkness and would be with him through every step until he passed safely through to the light on the other side. He goes on, he said, Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The image of the Psalms shifts slightly from the strict comparison of a sheep's life over to a human experience of encountering and dealing with enemies. Not long after Samuel identified young David and he anointed him to be the next king, David began to face opposition. Let me save you some, uh, some worry or, or, or some confusion in your life right now. If God prophesied, if there's great things that saying that fits and happen coming your way, get ready because the opposition is coming right behind it. It's just the way it works. So when David became king, or up to that time, David began to face opposition, and for nearly 10 years, Saul sought his life. Then David became king, and he had to battle against invaders. He had to battle against enemy nations throughout most of his reign. And sadly, there was Absalom, his own son, who tried to seize the kingdom from him. David testified that his shepherd, the Lord, was with him in every battle, strengthening, refreshing him throughout. For the Lord fed and nourished him. He spread a table for him in the very presence of his enemies. David was surely thinking of those who had supplied food to him when he was a fugitive in the wilderness. In various circumstances, the Lord had used these people to provide for David he said, Thou anointest my head with oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. The Lord had empowered David with his spirit in every battle. Samuel had anointed David with oil when he identified him as Israel's future king. And the Lord had preserved David in his many battles in order to fulfill his anointed purpose. But here's the part I want to talk about on the oil. Shepherds applied oil to their sheep. When a sheep was injured, the shepherd would use the oil to soothe and to heal his wounds. They would pour oil on the sheep's head and, and on their back to repel the insects. And as they grazed, the fragrance of the oil would also repel the snakes that hid in that thick grass. I, I, I could go under so much I could go into that some of the things that's actually in the blood of a sheep is the very antidote that they use. If you are bitten by a poisonous snake, that will, it will fight off in a sheep that they use. But I don't have time for that. I, I got one verse here to finish up on and then one last verse. They're not going to be able to come over here right now anyway, y'all. So I might as well just keep going. Hallelujah. It says, my cup runneth over. The Lord showered David with his blessings in the midst of the battle. His cup overflowed not only with the provisions that he needed throughout the battle, but also with the confidence, with the joy, with the love of the Lord in his life. Though David's soul was often in distress, his spirit never ran dry. God provided all that he needed during the battles. How comforted it is to know that we are never alone in life's battles. Life's darkest valleys is surely the valley of the shadow of death. At times in our lives, we often pass through the death shadow and we escape to live another day. But if the Lord delays his return, a day will come when we will all fall into that grip. Many live with a terrible fear of dying, but there's no need for the Lord's sheep to be afraid. Our great shepherd, Jesus Christ, passed through the death valley and he came up triumph on the other side. Hallelujah. I'm going to move forward to the last verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. David looked back over the events of his life. He could see the faithfulness of his servant. Of, 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 of his shepherd, excuse me. The Lord's constant care filled him with great assurance and hope for the future. But that... He knew he had been a fugitive. He knew he went through so many different things. But the Lord had proven true to his character and his word. And David expected God's goodness to continue for the rest of his life. 
He knew that Jehovah would be unfailingly true to his great name. And look at this. And I will dwell, David said, in the house of the Lord forever. Here is David. If scholars are correct in their timing, he's getting ready to die. He's not talking about his kingdom. He's not talking about his crown. He's not talking about his throne. He's not talking about his mighty armies. He's not talking about how much gold and silver that he has. He's talking about one thing. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now here's a way, when I was studying this, I've never seen it. I realized it could have been talking about literally that house at that time. But God's house had not been built yet. Solomon was going to build that. I believe David was saying, and he's saying what we all have to realize, that if we allow the Lord to be our shepherd, that there will come a day like David, that that house in eternity, in heaven, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And when my life is over with, I'm going to dwell in God's house. And I'm going to do it forever. I'm going to, forever is eternity. I'm going to do it forever. I ask you today, I ask you today, if you could take these, and I almost did it, but I felt to go this route. And we could say it like this. If I had to do it in reverse, the Lord is not my shepherd. I will want. He don't make me lie down in green pastures. He don't leave me beside still waters. He don't restore my soul. He don't lead me in the path of righteous for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear evil. For he's not with me. His rod and his staff they don't comfort me. Let me keep your attention. He don't prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He don't anoint my head with oil. My cup is not running over. Goodness and mercy won't follow me all the days of my life. And because of that, I will not be able to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want the Lord to be my shepherd. How about you? Hallelujah. 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 Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's look forward to a great move of God in this second service with a great pre-service prayer. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.